Throughout all time, humanity has pondered, why am I here? Are we part of a greater story, stretching from the past into the present and the future? Amid the chaos that seems to be ever increasing around the world, can we find a firm foundation? What lies ahead for the human race? As we discover the teachings of scripture and compare them with historical and modern events, these questions and many more will be answered. Welcome to Amazing Prophecies, where we will go on a journey to discover the incredible truths from the Bible and what they mean for our lives today. Now, out of all the prophecies of the Bible, the mark of the beast is probably one of them that scares people the most, gets, gets the most questions. And it's probably because our generation has long forgotten the essential principles of Bible study. We tend to get our ideas from where? From Hollywood, right? From all those books and movies out there. And if there's one idea that Hollywood has really milked, it's that... It's that there is something horrific in this concept of Mark of the Beast. But tonight, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to set aside the movie industry, amen? We're going to set aside all the books, all the stuff like that, and we're going to see what the Bible actually says about the Mark of the Beast. And I think you're going to discover that God has a way of speaking very clearly, amen? But before we begin, we need to pray and ask the Lord to be with us tonight. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven... Tonight, we come to your word with expectation. Lord, we are going to study a very challenging subject tonight, and I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that we may see clearly from your word the real issue in the last days. Lord, I pray that Jesus would be lifted up tonight. I pray that you would forgive me of my sins, and may I be hid behind the cross of Christ. And may everyone here in this church and everyone watching online gain a clearer understanding of your word and may they see where we are living in the time in history and may they also make the decision to stand up for Christ in these last days. I thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer for I ask it with all my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the question burning on many people's minds what is the mark of the beast? Some people think the mark of the beast is a, a strange tattoo with 666 on your forehead. People wonder if maybe it's an identification number issued by some mastermind who, who wants to take over the world. Others say maybe it's barcodes on packages at the grocery store. They've heard about Revelation 13 and, and they say that maybe those who accept the mark of the beast they're not able to buy and sell, so, so they wonder if maybe it's a barcode on a can or on a label. There was a biotech company called Novartis that was making a microchip they called Raisin, and they were going to stick it in your skin, and it would tell you when to take your pills. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you need some help remembering taking your pills, but I don't know if you want a chip in your skin. Some Christians looked at this, and they said, there it is. That's probably the mark of the beast. Where do we go to get our information about what the mark of the beast is? we got to go to the Bible, amen? Now, if you walk into a Christian bookstore, and we've talked about this before, and if you look at the different books on Bible prophecy, you're going to see lots of different things. One book says this, another book says this. Buy 100 books, you're going to get 100 different viewpoints. <clears throat> but what's strange about that is that for hundreds of years, there was actually widespread agreement on Bible prophecy. If you go back in history, you'll see it. All the way down through the centuries, many Christian leaders recognized that the beast power that we looked at a few nights ago from Revelation 13 was the Christian church of the Dark Ages. Luther said it. Calvin said it. Zwingli said it. John Wesley said it. Charles Spurgeon said it. Dwight L. Moody said it. All the way up until about 150 years ago, there was widespread agreement. <clears throat> In fact, it was so widespreadly, un so understood clearly by most Christians, 
that the Counter-Reformation in the 1500s actually had to address the issue because everybody realized that Revelation 13 was talking about the Christian church. And, and we, we, I won't get into this in detail, but there were a couple, a couple of counter-Reformation scholars by the name of Ribera and Alcazar who came up with alternate theories about the second coming, theories that were deliberately trying to take people's attention off of the church. Alcazar, he said that, he said that there, was a, there was a thing called preterism, which said that almost everything in the book of Revelation happened in the distant past so it couldn't possibly be talking about the church and therefore wasn't relevant in the sense. Now, it's not very popular today. But this other guy, Ribera, he had a theory called futurism, and he basically said that everything in the book of Revelation would happen right at the end of time, right before Jesus comes. And so basically in that theory, the church can't be the beast because it's going to happen right before Jesus comes. And this has become very, very popular in today's Christian circles. We talked about the theories of the secret rapture, left behind, all of that. That comes out of this futurism theory. At first, those new theories didn't really gain much ground, but in the 1800s, futurism in particular suddenly went mainstream, and it became so popular among many Christian churches. And it turns out that that, develop was, that development was actually part of a prophetic scenario. Tonight, let's pick up the story one more time in Revelation chapter 12. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth... Friends, remember, who is the dragon? Satan, right? He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Now again, the woman here in Bible prophecy represents who? The church, right? God's people. And who? Now we didn't study this in detail, but the male child here, who do you think it would represent? Jesus Christ. All right. The the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time. Now, do you remember we studied this? A time was representative of what? One year, right? Times was what? Two years. Half a time? Half a year, right? So if we put that together, that equals 1,260 days. We'll get there in a second. So again, nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the pure church, or God's people, had to go into hiding because there was an impure woman sitting on the throne of Western Europe. The church had married the state, and the results were disastrous. So across all the Western world, groups of Christians had to go into hiding. Remember, we watched that video about the Waldenses. Do you guys remember that? Several nights ago. People like the Waldenses, the Ethiopian Christians in North Africa, the Celts up in Britain, the Huguenots in France, all these believers were not welcome in the Roman Empire and they were persecuted. Many of them were burned at the stake or they were killed. The Waldenses, remember we talked about their story, many of them were slaughtered because they believed in the truths of the Bible and they wouldn't bow to the authority of the church. The Bible says that they had to hide themselves in the wilderness for a time, times, and half a time. And as we saw in some passages, it talks about that being 1,260 days. Remember that. Or another way it refers to it is 42 months. Because remember, 12 plus 12 plus 12 plus 6 is 42. This is the same. They're all talking about the same period. The 1,260 years of the Dark Ages. Now, this is all review. We talked about this a few nights ago. It began when, friends? 538 A.D. Now, why was that? Remember, that's when the authority granted to the Bishop of Rome by the Emperor Justinian becomes a reality. If you remember, there were three tribes who stood in the way. Remember the three horns that the Bible says would be plucked up. Do you remember that? And by 538, the last of them was destroyed, the Ostrogoths, and now the power of the Roman bishop in the Western Western Empire became supreme. And then, exactly 1,260 years later, in 1798, one of Napoleon's generals, General Berthier, marches into the city of Rome and takes Pope Pius VI 
captive. He takes him off the throne, and the Pope dies in captivity. This is the year that the beast receives the deadly wound. Is that clear to everybody? Again, we're kind of reviewing what we've looked at before. 538 to 1798, 1260 years, and exactly right on schedule in 1798, the Pope is removed from his seat of authority. It was during this time that the impure woman, or which represents the church of the Dark Ages, was in power in Europe, and she persecutes the woman of Revelation 12 who is in hiding. And the Bible says this persecution would be very, very bad. Revelation 12, 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. So the Bible predicted that the dragon would literally turn up the heat. It it, it predicted that he would pour on the persecution like a flood coming out of the serpent's mouth. But he ultimately fails to stomp out Christianity. Amen? He says... He couldn't get rid of the male child, so if I could just get rid of her, the woman. I couldn't stop Jesus from coming, but but maybe I can stomp out these people out of existence. Maybe I can stop the second coming from happening. The dragon is trying to destroy the woman. In other words, Satan was trying to destroy God's faithful people. But what happened next? Revelation 12, verse 16. But the earth, what everyone? The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. At some point in history, the earth suddenly opens up to give God's people a place to run, a way to flee from the persecution. It's as if the planet suddenly gets bigger and God's people suddenly have a new place to go. Now let me ask you a question tonight, because you and I have the benefit of hindsight. Did the persecuted masses of Europe find a place to go where they could be free? Where did they go to flee persecution? Where did they go to find religious liberty? Now now let me just say one thing important to note in Bible prophecy. Remember we talked about waters, right? What did waters represent? Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Remember that? You guys with me? A plus. Amen. You guys are good Bible students. Amen. So it's, it's like waters represent many peoples, and waters represented the Gentile nations of Europe. But here we see the opposite of water, which is what? Earth, right? And in a sense, it's representing the desolate, uninhabited lands of the Americas. Where did the people go, friends, to find religious freedom? They came to the New World. James Madison, one of the founding fathers of our country, tells us exactly why they believed the birth of America was so important. The founding fathers of the American Republic understood very clearly exactly what they were building. They were building a place where persecuted people could finally be free to keep the hands of the church off the state and to keep the hands of the state off the church. Amen. They did not want to repeat what had happened in Europe. James Madison said this, the purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe with blood for centuries. The founding fathers of our nation knew exactly what the problem was and they knew exactly who the culprit was. You see, they were Bible students, they were historians. So they designed a place where people of faith could be free. A place where the church could never seize the reins of government like it had done in the Western Roman Empire. America gave the world absolute freedom from religious persecution. It offered the freedom to live according to the dictates of your conscience. People were free to worship God however they wanted. And they were also free not to worship God if that's what they wanted. Because America was designed to be free. The government couldn't kill you for your opinion. And even though our freedom has definitely been eroding in the last few years, this is still a free country. Amen. How many of you are thankful for this nation? How many of you are thankful for the freedoms that we enjoy? 
Friends, it's a blessing. We are free to come and worship here tonight. Amen? We don't have to worry about the government shutting it. I mean, the Texas state troopers aren't going to come and tell us to go home. The state church is not going to tell us to stop meeting. Do you realize there are many places in the world where people are not free? You know, I work for Adventist World Radio. I've shared with you stories. Maybe not. I wish I could share more. I won't go off on it. But there are places, friends, where we cannot have, where people cannot meet like this and study the Bible together. Friends, we are blessed to live in the United States of America. Praise the Lord. We can worship God however you want, and you can, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But when America was born, America was born free. God bless America. I love these powerful words that are on the Statue of Liberty. Some of you may remember this from school. It's a poem by Emma Lazarus. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Have any of you been to the Statue of Liberty and seen those words? Doesn't it? It makes you proud as an American, right? To see the freedom that we enjoy. Friends, those are beautiful words. And it almost makes me think of something Jesus said. Come to me, all ye who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Friends, in the beginning, America was a Christ-like country. Not because we were building a theocracy uh, where the church runs the nation, but because people were free to serve God as their king if they so choose. And there were no human intermediaries like a pope or a king. A nation of the people, by the people, for the people. If you follow the history, you discover that the principles that gave us the American Constitution can be traced all the way back to the Reformation. And the reformers, you see, they were people who wanted freedom for the individual to be able to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. And really, one of the most amazing things about our country, friends, is the timing of when we started. When did this nation, when were we born? When did we declare independence? Kids, when, did, when was that? July 4, 1776. Amen. The Liberty Bell rang and it cracked. They rang it so hard. Praise the Lord. Very interesting, though, friends. Did you notice that the end of the 1260 days was 1798? At the same time period that our country was founded, that prophetic period was coming to a close. Napoleon's general Berthier marches into Rome in 1798. The American Republic is founded in 1776. Those two events happening almost at the same time America rises to power just as the deadly beast receives its wound. You have to wonder, is it a coincidence? Not even close. Let's go back to Revelation 13 because I want to show you something really, really amazing. Revelation 13 and verse 3. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And what does it say? His deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Now the first two verses of Revelation 13 are already in the past. But verse 3, this verse, is the part that our generation really needs to be concerned about. The Bible says there will be a revival of this beast. Now, friends, did the beast receive a deadly wound? Yes or no? Yes, it did. In 1798... After Pius VI was removed from his throne, the church lost possession of its lands, and it looked as if the beast was dead. But the Bible says it will come back to life, and the deadly wound will be healed. Now here's the question we need to think about tonight. Is there any evidence that that might already be happening? Now I want to tell you, you might want to buckle your seatbelts for what I'm about to get into. So, okay, so you can buckle your seatbelts. Because what I found here blew me away when I first studied it. Are your seatbelts buckled? Are you guys ready? All right, here we go. The answer to that question is yes. About the same time that America is becoming a global superpower, something amazing happens in the city of Rome. On February 11, Benito Mussolini, 
the dictator of, of Italy, and Cardinal Gaspari meet at the Lateran Palace and suddenly sign a deal that restores the power, land, and self-government of the Vatican. It was a huge story, and it made international headlines at the time because the autonomy of the Pope was being restored. They gave everything back. Suddenly, the Bishop of Rome had his power back. And it might be a coincidence, but do you know what the headlines in the United States said on that very day? Heal wound of many years. Now, friends, is that a coincidence? Well, it might be. But it's a very interesting coincidence, wouldn't you say? If you go back and read the newspapers from 1929, you'll see the whole world thought this was a very big deal. Let me show you an article from the Catholic Advocate that came out just a few weeks later. It is noon on Monday, the fateful February 11, and we are standing by the obelisk at the north door of the mother of churches of the world. Interesting language there. St. John's, we have watched the first Cardinal Gaspari and the premier Mussolini drive into Lateran Palace. By the way, do you remember the Lateran Palace? We talked about it. It was the place that Constantine gave the Bishop of Rome his power. And this is where now the power is handed back to the Bishop of Rome once again. Interesting. So they're into the Lateran Palace, and they are now seal sealing the accord between the Holy See and Italy. I do not deny it. I am in a tremble at the pregnant greatness of the moment, for my mind is dwelling not only on the piazza or on the scene behind the palace windows. My thoughts are shooting like a shuttle of a loom out from Rome to the four corners of the globe, weaving a fabric of the reverberations which this freeing of the Pope will awaken in every country. What does it say happened that day, friends? The freeing of the Pope. And see, now the Roman Church is suddenly free to start reclaiming her global influence. And the question that you and I need to ask is whether or not it's already happening. Is Rome taking back what she lost? The answer is absolutely yes. And you can find it in the headlines almost every single day, friends. But the world isn't really paying attention because the world is no longer conversant. The world no longer really understands Bible prophecy. In the last few years, the Church of Rome has been actively reasserting almost every single doctrine it taught at the height of the Dark Ages. Did you know that? Now let me just pause here a minute. I just have to pause. You remember when we talked about this issue a few nights ago? When we talked about the change of the Sabbath? Very important point, friends. We're talking about a system here. Amen? We're not talking about individual Christians. We're not talking about individual faithful Roman Catholics. Does that make sense? Amen? There are many faithful Christians out there who are following Christ to the best of their ability and to all that they know. But we have to be honest with history. And we have to be honest with what the Bible teaches. So that's why we're looking at this, because I want you to see clearly what the Bible is saying about the mark of the beast. And I know this is hard stuff, and I know there are many faithful Catholics, but I just want you to look here at the system that we're talking about, the history, okay? In 1998, Pope John Paul II was getting ready for the millennium, and he issued a papal bull called Incarnatonius Mysterium, and in that document, he reaffirmed the practice of indulgences, one of the very issues that sparked the Reformation in the first place. Also in 1998, John Paul II issued an affirmation of, a, of, a, of an organization called the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Now that's a very old institution, and it used to go by another name. Do you know what that is? The Holy Office of the Inquisition. And interestingly, it's the organization responsible for enforcing doctrinal purity and the unity of the Roman Church around the world. And do you know who the leader of that institution was in 1998? It was Joseph Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict XVI. Then in the year 2000, the Vatican published a very interesting document. It was a document about Christian unity, specifically calling to unify behind the church. It's a very similar to what we see there in Revelation 13. They were calling people back to Rome. Listen to this very carefully. The church of Christ, despite the divisions which exist among Christians, continues to exist fully only in what? In the Catholic church. And on the other hand, that outside her structure, 
many elements can be found of sanctification and truth, that is, in those churches and ecclesial communities which are not yet in full communion with the Catholic Church. Now let me ask you, those words are very interesting. Why does it say, not yet? It's because there's a clear agenda, friends. A plan to restore everything that has been lost. There's a plan to bring us all back under the same umbrella. Now follow me very carefully tonight. The wound is already healing. And all over the world, Christians who have forgotten the history are starting to go back, even though not one single key doctrine has changed since the Middle Ages. Not one. And this revival is building faster than you might think. Just listen to this story from The Guardian back in 2007. Protestant churches yesterday reacted with dismay to a new declaration approved by Pope Benedict XVI, insisting they were mere ecclesial communities and their ministers effectively phonies with no right to give communion, coming just four days after the reinstatement of the Latin Mass. Yesterday's document left no doubt about the Pope's eagerness to back traditional Roman Catholic practices and attitude. Did you catch that, friends? Even the Latin Mass is being reinstituted. There has been a definite push for the Roman Church to reclaim the past and go back to the old ways. And here's the amazing thing. Even as the Church rebuilds, Bible prophecy says that she's going to have some help from a very surprising and powerful ally. Did you know that? Who do you think that might be? Revelation 13. Then I saw another beast. Who exactly is the second beast? Coming up out of the what? Earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. So the Bible says it comes up out of the earth from the very place God's people escaped to, from the place that opened up to help the woman. The beast looks like a lamb, and a lamb is who? Who does a lamb represent? Jesus, right? Right? But it's a beast. And a beast, again, as we've seen throughout our series, represents what? Not a person, but a, right, a political power, a kingdom, a political power. It looks Christ-like, but eventually, when it opens its mouth, it speaks like a dragon. You see, this is another mix of Christianity and the dragon, just like Rome. Now, I know some of you are already figuring it out. I can see, I can see, I can tell. But let's keep reading. Let's just keep reading what the Bible says here. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So this says that the second beast is going to drive the earth back towards what? Who? The first beast. Is that clear? The Bible says that it plays a supportive role, whether it knows it or not, and it helps restore the power and authority of the first beast. So who exactly is this second beast? We have lots of evidence to go on. Let's look at this together. Number one, the Bible says that this second beast comes up from where? From the earth, from the very place where God's people escaped to, to escape persecution. The first one, remember, came out of the sea, which represented what? The nations of Europe, right? The many peoples of Europe. But this one comes from the less inhabited region of the earth. It's also lamb-like. In other words, it puts out the appearance of being a Christian power. And you'll notice that it has no crowns on its horns. The first beast had a crown on every horn, but this beast has none. And that's because this is a political power without a king. It's a republic. So who is this? There's only one thing, friends, in history that fits this description. Tonight, you tell me, a powerful Christian nation, remote from Europe, a home for the persecuted, in the world, new world, and has no king. Who is this? It's us. There's only one thing that this can be. And this is hard for me to read. Friends, I know this is hard to hear. This is the United States of America. 
America begins to rise on the world stage in conjunction with the revolutionary movements that take place in the 18th century. France is pulling Pius VI off his throne, and the American Republic is established at about the same time. It makes its appearance as a nation as the first beast is wounded. It has a Christ-like appearance. America has been calling itself, since the middle of the 20th century, one nation under God. It has a separation of church and state. It has freedom of conscience built on Christian principles. No question about it. Amen. It still is a refuge for the persecuted masses of the world, and it is most definitely a powerful republic that has no king. Friends, does America fit the description of the second beast, yes or no? It fits like a glove. What's going to happen? Does that mean America, the America that we know is going to change? I believe it does, friends. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but our country is already changing. In the last few decades, especially since 9-11, have we noticed our freedoms begin to erode, yes or no? Have we noticed that? I could go through many countless examples of how our freedoms have been eroded, not the least of which is the NSA. Now, I actually have a friend who works at the NSA back in D.C., so I'm not going to say anything negative, okay? <laughs> but he actually doesn't admit that he works at the NSA. He says he's a gardener for the government. Anyway, <clears throat> they can't talk about it. But, but seriously, guys, we have, we have ceded freedoms. They can listen to our phone calls. Stuff like this happens. We've been witnessing the slow erosion of religious freedom. We've been watching it fall apart. And when you look through the lens of Bible prophecy, it all begins to make sense. Something strange is happening. The Bible predicts an alliance between the United States of America and the Bishop of Rome. Now, I know it sounds impossible, and I used to also think that maybe it was impossible, but then I started to study history in the Bible, and it makes sense, friends. Back in 1991, a guy by the name of Malachi Martin published a book about the political ambitions of the Vatican. He was a professor at the Pontifical Biblical Institute at the Vatican, and his book had a really long title. Have any of you seen this book? The Keys of This Blood, Pope John Paul II versus Russia and the West for Control of the New World Order. It was a big, thick book. And it really rattled some of the officials at the Vatican because it put all the cards on the table, so to speak. It pulled back the curtain and it showed us Rome's agenda. Listen to this. The goal is a geopolitical structure for the society of nations designed and maintained according to the ethical plans and doctrinal outlines of Christianity as taught by the Roman pontiff as the early earthly vicar of Christ. He was telling us that John Paul II had a very clear agenda. He wanted to provide a political structure that unified the whole world and gave it religious guidance. There were just two obstacles standing in the way. One of them was over in the former Soviet Union. The communist world was standing in its way, and of course, the other one was in the West. The principles of religious liberty were going to prevent any unity of church and state and discourage people from supporting any kind of world government. Now, you'll notice that since this book was written, one of those obstacles is already gone, isn't it? Because the Soviet Union collapsed almost overnight back in 1989. How many of you remember that event? Some of you remember it. Some of you don't. <laughs> I was pretty young. But I tell you, I have gone to museums and I have touched pieces of the Berlin Wall because the Berlin Wall no longer exists. Was it really just hard economic times that caused the fall of communism? Not quite. The Vatican knew they couldn't topple Russia all by themselves because the Pope doesn't have an army. What they needed was a really good ally, so Pope John Paul II went looking for one. Who can I get to help me? And what he noticed here in the West is that Americans also don't like communism. And Ronald Reagan really hated communism. Now watch what happens next. Reader's Digest told the whole story back in 1990 after the Soviet Union collapsed. In 1981, the communist bloc got another shock. A new American president, Ronald Reagan, began fulfilling his promise to challenge the Soviets not placate them. Over the next few years, he accelerated the military buildup and announced the strategic defense initiative. The Soviets' confidence was shaken. Military pressure from America and its Western allies had caused the Soviets to flinch. 
So John Paul II looks at Ronald Reagan and says, this is my guy. This is the perfect ally. And he just happens to be the most powerful man on earth. And Reagan knew how to deal with Russia. Remember what Reagan said about the Berlin Wall to Mikhail Gorbachev? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Remember that? I'm glad he said that, by the way. This is not a critique of Ronald Reagan, okay? I appreciate the fact that he fought against communism, but it's how history played out. By the way, communism is terrible, what it does to human beings. It belittles them. It tears them down. But Washington gets a phone call from the Bishop of Rome, and together, John Paul II and Ronald Reagan develop a plan. And in July of 1982, they met to discuss a strategy for bringing down the Soviet Union. They decided that they needed an insider, someone on the inside of the Soviet Union to help them. And they found that man in the Pope's home country of Poland, a man by the name of Leku Wensa. He was from the Pope's own country, the leader of Poland's solidarity movement, and Reagan and the Pope contacted him, and they gave him all the support he needed, cash, phone lines, moral support, fax machines, you name it, they supported this guy. And of course, the Soviets found out what was happening, and they tried to shut it down. They threatened to send troops into Poland to squash the solidarity movements. And that's when John Paul II said that he personally would stand in front of those tanks if that's what it took to stop the Russians and he said, if you do this, you're going to have one of the biggest PR nightmares on your hands you will ever see. It was a high-stakes political game. Here's a story from the Reader's Digest about that moment. With the Pope's support, solidarity was formed, and John Paul II sent word to Moscow that if Soviet forces crushed solidarity, he would go to Poland and stand with his people. The Soviets were so alarmed, they hatched a plot to kill him. When the communist government fell, the impact on Eastern Europe was electrifying. Now let me ask you again, how did Soviet communism really fall? The first and second beast worked together to make it happen. And that's a historical fact. Maybe you remember this headline from 1992. Time magazine covered this story and look at the way it says it. The headline on February 24, 1992. Holy Alliance. How Reagan and the Pope conspired to assist Poland's solidarity movement and hasten the demise of communism. Very interesting. Now think about this carefully, friends. Almost 200 years ago, the book of Revelation said there would be an alliance, and back in 1980, nobody would have believed it. But prophecy was absolutely right, and that means the alliance is already here. It also means that the Vatican's first obstacle, the Soviet Union, is already gone. What was the other obstacle? It's us. It's the separation of church and state here in the West. It's religious liberty. And as long as the wall between church and state remains, as long as Americans resist world government and they fight for religious liberty, Rome can't have everything she wants. Now, obviously, the Bishop of Rome can't send armies to fight America on the battlefield, right? But he doesn't have to. All he has to do is change our minds. All he has to do is influence the way that we think. And that's been going on now for years. Do you think it's a coincidence that every time we've had an election in recent history, the Pope's opinion really seems to matter to a lot of people? Have you noticed that? No, I don't think it's a coincidence. And if you listen carefully, you will notice in recent decades, there have been strong religious voices calling for the end of, of the separation of church and state. In fact, there are surprising voices trying to convince us that there never even was a separation. I've heard these voices, friends, but these voices are wrong. Listen here to the words of our founding father, Thomas Jefferson, believing that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that the act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Hands off the state. The, the church needs to keep its hands off the state. The state needs to keep its hands off the church. Amen. 
And when the American Republic was born, it was a country that did not want the problems that Europe had. That was the whole point of the Constitution. But amazingly, in recent decades, there's been loud voices calling for the removal of that wall of separation. Here's Richard McMung, the editor of Columbia Magazine, late leading the charge back in February of 1989. If Thomas Jefferson were alive today, I believe he would not only lead the struggle to scale the wall of separation, but that he would also provide the ladders. Now ask yourself the question, why would prominent Roman Catholic voices want the wall of separation banished? The American Cardinal Anthony Bevil I can't even say his last name. <laughs> well, Beviliqua said, the time has come to restore the vital relationship between the church and the state, between religion and law. Now ask yourself the question, why would the cardinal want to build a vital relationship between the church and the state? Why would the wall of separation be a problem? Friends, think about American politics since the 1980s. More and more voices have called for the unity of the church and the state. And these weren't just Roman Catholic voices. Even the president of a major church said, I believe this notion of the separation of church and state was the figment of some infidel's imagination. There are more and more voices calling for the abolition of this wall. And to be honest, friends, you know, I kind of understand why. I mean, there's been so much moral decay in our country that many Americans are eager to do something about it. But friends, we can never forget why we kept the hands of the church off the state in the first place. Amen? We cannot legislate faith. Now, friends, I want to say something very clearly. I'm not saying that Christians should not run for public office. To be honest, I wish more of them would. I'll share more about this on Sabbath, but I actually wanted to be in public office. I was actually planning to run for office myself. I worked in the White House as an intern when I was in college. But God took me in a different direction. But friends, I just want to say, as we look at history and as we look at this evidence, we can see there have been movements to seize the reins of government and pass laws forcing people in regards to their faith. Look at the attitudes of our generation, friends. We've actually come to the point where Christians are saying the Reformation was a mistake, a misunderstanding. This statement came from the head of one of the biggest evangelical TV networks in the world. He said this, I'm eradicating the word Protestant even out of my vocabulary. I'm not protesting anything. It's time for Catholics and non-Catholics to come together as one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. Now let me ask you, is that really true? Should Christians be united? Yes, they should, but not through compromise, amen? The only way for Christians to find real unity is by standing on the truths of God's word. Real unity comes from standing on his word. Jesus said, sanctify them by, my, by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Here's another surprising quote, again, from a prominent Christian leader. This one came from one of the most popular TV preachers in the world, Robert Schuller. It's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd and say, what do we have to do to come home? The shepherd, referring to, he's referring to here, is the Bishop of Rome. And he was saying that we should apologize for the stand we took on the Bible 500 years ago. Just a few years ago, a huge gathering of evangelical Christians went viral on YouTube. There was a video invitation from Pope Francis inviting people to come home. He compared himself to Joseph and called us the brothers who betrayed him. But I'll take you back, he said. And unbelievably, one of the most famous Christian preachers in America, Kenneth Copeland, stood up and accepted the invitation. Did you see that video? Friends, listen to me carefully. Something remarkable is happening. We've forgotten the long history of where we've come from, and we've stopped living by the principles taught in the Word of God. The Bible says that the second beast will convince the earth to return to the worship of the first beast. What we're going to look at now is the future. We've looked at the past. Now we're going to look at the future. Revelation 13, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not what? Worship the image of the beast to be killed. Friends, what is the central issue in the last days? Worship. It's the same issue as it's always been. It's been about worship. Lucifer wanted people to worship him. Worship has always been the issue. And he still wants people to forget the Creator God and worship Him. And if deception fails, he's going to turn to his other tool, and that is the use of force. Revelation 13, 15 to 17. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark 
on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there it is, the mark of the beast. And where does the Bible say that it goes? On the forehead or on the hand. Now that should sound familiar to those of you who have been studying Bible prophecy because the Bible says also that God puts something on our foreheads, doesn't it? Revelation 14 told us that those who follow the Lamb in the last days have what on their foreheads? The Father's name. They have God's character etched in their minds and in their hearts. Amen? That's the part of the story no one ever seems to talk about when you hear about the mark of the beast. Everybody talks about the mark of the beast. Everybody talks about the mark on your forehead and on your hand. But if you read the whole Bible, you'll see that God has a mark on his people too. Now, why the mark on your forehead? It's because that's where your mind is, friends. That's where you make your decisions. Paul wrote in Romans 7, 25, with the mind I myself serve the law of God. The forehead is a symbol for your mind. And why is there a mark on the hand? It's because your hand represents your actions. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So according to the Bible, both God and the beast have a mark. They have a sign. They have a seal of their authority. Both of them have a mark of their claim on your life. And believe me, friends, you want to make sure you know which mark you've got. Because there are only two. God writes his name on your forehead, or you get the mark of the beast. So what is the mark of the beast? The answer, friends, is really simple. All you have to do is look at the people who do not have the mark of the beast In Revelation chapter 14. Revelation 14. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Now I want you to notice, these people do not have the mark. And they're warning the whole world not to get it. So where are these people? It spells it out in the next few verses, in the next few words. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep what? The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Friends, this is not really complicated. These people keep the commandments of God and have the faith of who? Of Jesus. And the Bible says that they do not have the mark. Amen? So what does that mean? The people who do have the mark of the beast do not keep the commandments. And they don't have the faith of Jesus. Does that make sense, everybody? It really is that simple. There are only two sides in the end. But then the Bible gets more specific because it talks about the mark of the beast and it talks about the seal of God. A mark that God puts on our foreheads. Revelation chapter 7. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God on their where? Foreheads. Where does the Bible say that we are sealed? On our foreheads. Again, that's the 144,000 it's talking about there in Revelation 7. Here's another passage that says the same thing. Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. What is written on their foreheads, friends? The father's name. That is how we are sealed, with the father's name. And of course, as we've already studied, the father's name is in his character. That's what he told Moses in Exodus 34. And in Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible says that God is writing His law in our where? In our hearts. And again, friends, the law is a picture of His very character. Amen. Now let me show you something really interesting. Listen to what Moses says right after he reminds the children of Israel the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5. He says, you shall bind them as a what? Sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your Do you see that word sign, friends? It's the Hebrew word oath. And it's the same word used in Genesis chapter 4 when the Bible says that God placed a mark on Cain. It means a sign. It means a seal or a mark. Those are usually interchangeable words. And what does Moses say about the Ten Commandments? 
He says that they're a sign, they're a mark that God's people put on their hands and between their eyes or on their foreheads. God writes his name or his character on their minds. Now, have any of you heard of a phylactery? Does anybody know what that is? Have you ever seen a Jewish person wear this on their head? If you go to Israel, you'll see this. Some of our Jewish friends literally put a little box on their hand and on their forehead, and inside that box is a copy of God's law. Friends, there's no question what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the forehead and the hand. It's talking about the law of God. Now listen again to what the Bible says here in the book of Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. God's people are sealed by God's law. That's why the Father's name or character is written on their foreheads. And there is one law in particular that the Bible considers a special sign or a seal between God and his people. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 20. Hallow my Sabbaths, and they will be a what? A sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Again, do you see the word sign here? It's that same Hebrew word, oath. The fourth commandment is the mark of God's authority. The fourth commandment is how God's people publicly display their trust in him. The Sabbath is how we show our loyalty to the Creator. This is how we tell the whole world who we believe belongs on the throne of the universe in our hearts. That's the reason the devil hates the fourth commandment so much, because it underlines who is on the throne and who is not. Friends, the big picture in Bible prophecy is amazing. The Sabbath is God's sign of authority with his people, and that's why God's people place such a high value on it. Do you see it? But the beast has a sign of his authority too. And what does the beast power say is his sign of authority? They say we can prove we are in charge because we can change God's times and laws. It's the fact that it changed the Sabbath. Remember the words of Cardinal James Gibbons. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. Speaking of the change of the Sabbath. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. Friends, don't forget, the biggest issue in the universe is what? It's worship. And the focal point of that issue for the human race is the fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath. You say, well, Kyle, that seems like such a tiny issue. I know. The tree in the garden seemed like a tiny issue too. But it's about loyalty. Friends, what is the mark of the beast's authority? It tampered with God's times and laws, and it told the world that it had the authority to change the Sabbath. Listen to the words of this Father T. Enright. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Friends, let me ask you tonight, in light of Bible prophecy, where do you offer your reverent obedience? It was the Catholic Church which has transferred this rest to Sunday in the remembrance of the resurrection of our Lord. Thus, the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the church. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof positive of the fact Folks, the beast power brags about it. Rome says that she changed God's times and laws, and the whole Christian world listens. The issue is about worship. The issue is about loyalty. And right now, tonight, the question comes, where is your loyalty? Are you following the dragon, or are you following the lamb? Tonight, you've got to make up your mind, friends, because things are happening faster than we could dream. We are literally running out of time. In 1998... Rome published an astonishing encyclical letter titled Dies Domini, The Day of the Lord. Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. That was just a random, off-the-cuff statement, do you think? Not a chance. Friends, there is a massive effort to force the world to toe the line with the Bishop of Rome, and it's unbelievable. So, so many people are missing it. Back in 2007, Benedict XVI made an amazing demand while visiting the country of Austria. Pope demands respect for Sundays, the headline said. 
In 2009, there was a massive push for Sunday observance all across Europe, and it was an initiative that actually went to the floor of the European Parliament. Here's what it said. The European Parliament calls on member states and the EU institutions to protect Sunday as a weekly rest day in forthcoming national and EU working time legislations. They're saying, we want a Sunday law, just like Constantine had way back when. It went to a vote and it failed by a very narrow margin. Why did it fail? The Eastern European countries said, no, we just got rid of the Nazis and the communists. We don't want Rome telling us what to do. Then in the fall, Pope Benedict told the world in his encyclical Caritas in Verite that the world needs a one world economy governed by someone who is not a political superpower. He told the world it needs a religious authority that has been granted global power. I wonder who he had in mind. And then in 2013, Pope Francis said this, It is not possible to find Jesus outside the church, and the mother church that gives us Jesus gives us our identity that is not only a seal, it is a belonging. In other words, if you don't join Rome, you can't find Jesus. Friends, there's only two sides in the end. Let me ask you tonight, where do you stand? What is written on your forehead? Revelation 15 and verse 2. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. Those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. Friends, as we close, I'm going to ask you a story. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You remember that story, Daniel chapter 3? What happens in that story? We won't tell the whole story, but you remember Nebuchadnezzar had told them that they were to bow down at the image when the music played, right? And if they didn't bow down, what would happen? They would be thrown into the fiery furnace. And, and, just, and just quickly, you remember that when the music played, did those three faithful men bow down? They did not. They stood tall because even though their lives were threatened, they were willing to stand for the king of kings. They were willing to stand for what is right. And then you remember that Nebuchadnezzar was so mad, he he gathered them up and he threw them into the fiery furnace. And it was ten times hotter. But then, even though they should have been instantly killed, he looked in that furnace and what did he see? He saw four men, not three. Because Christ himself came down into that fiery furnace. They were willing to go to their death, even if it meant they were willing to stand up for Christ, even if it meant going to their death, but they were willing to take a stand for truth. There was a Russian girl named Natasha. She was seven years old. Her father was a pastor during the communist time. They wouldn't let her father preach. So he asked Natasha if she would go to the neighborhood kids and and tell them stories about Jesus. So she started doing that. And one night she realized it was getting late, it was 10 o'clock, but she was five miles from home, and so she started to walk. She was tired and she was walking through the snow, and a car stopped right next to her. And they said, little girl, come in the car. She said, I don't know who you are. They said, what are you doing late at night? She said, I'm playing games and telling stories. What kind of stories, they said. Stories about Jesus. You can't tell stories about Jesus. It's against the law. This is a communist nation. Who is your father? So she told them, your father is our enemy. We're going to kill him. Where is your house? Suddenly she tried to run away, but they grabbed her. And they, 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 they grabbed her and they put her in the car and they drove to a bridge and they told her that they were going to throw her into the icy river, little seven-year-old Natasha. But you know what she said to those guys? She laughed. She said, you can't do that. Haven't you heard about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? How God saved them when they were thrown into the fiery furnace because the flames couldn't kill them? They came out alive. The officer got so mad, they stopped the car. They took her out, and they picked her up, and they started to swing her off the bridge. They counted one. And they were hoping she would recant her belief. Two. And right before they were about to say three, suddenly a loud voice said, stop. And in the darkness, they were so shocked that there was a voice. They dropped her in the snow. They were scared to death. 
They got in the car and they ran away. And they never bothered Natasha again. Friends, if a seven-year-old girl can stand up for her faith, can you and I stand up for Jesus tonight? It's not a statue on the plains of Dura. It's a day. It's the fourth commandment. It's your decision to follow the Lamb wherever He leads you. And right at this moment, I want to give you an opportunity to take your stand. Renika is going to play a song. And as you hear this song, friends, I want you to think about those who have courageously stood for Christ in the past. I want to invite you tonight to make the decision to stand for Christ. One day we're going to stand on that sea of glass, amen, forever. And we're going to be with Christ. Tonight I invite you, give your heart 100% to the Lamb of God. Reject the mark of the beast. Choose to have His seal on your forehead. Let us choose to follow Jesus with all of our hearts. To stand for Christ. Maybe you haven't made that decision for rebaptism or baptism. I want to invite you. I know the hour is late, but just make that decision tonight. Don't put it off another day, friends. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We've got a baptism coming up this Sabbath. We would love to have you join us. If there's someone here tonight, is there anybody here that would just like to say, Lord, I want to, I feel like the, the Holy Spirit is moving on my heart and I'd like to think about getting baptized or rebaptized. Would you just raise your hand? If there is someone here, we would love to invite you to consider that. Come and talk to me afterwards. Come and talk to Pastor. We'll be happy to help you get ready. Tonight as we close with prayer, I just invite you to stand with me. If that is your desire, to stand for Christ in the last days. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you that your word tells us so clearly that in the last days the issue is about worship. Lord, thank you that you were willing to go to the cross for us. You were willing to take a stand for us so that we could have hope of eternal life. And I pray tonight that each one here in this church and each one watching online would also say in their hearts that they want to stand for you. Lord, we want your seal to be in our minds and in our hearts. We want to follow you wherever you go, Lord. And one day we're going to stand on that sea of glass with all the saved of eternity and we're going to sing your praises. Father, I pray that everyone here tonight would be there on that day. May not one be missing. And Lord, for whatever the special needs are of everyone here, I pray that you would grant them those requests. And Lord, please, Father, help us to be ready for your soon return, we pray. Thank you for hearing this prayer, for we ask it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn more Bible truth, I invite you to subscribe below. Also, click here to watch one of my favorite videos. And click here, top left, to watch this series in full. God bless you.